After establishing the New England colonies around the year 1620, the colonists began to rebuild their lives that they had brought with themselves from England. The fishing industry, however, was slow to come about. It is not until the year 1631 that the first permanent commercial fishing station in the New World was established in Marblehead, Massachusetts. The cod industry was one of the most valuable industries in all of colonial America and it was the single most lucrative export business in New England. Before the American Revolution, the fishing industry in New England represented 35% of the region's total export revenue. The cotton industries also employed a significant portion of colonial New England population. Of the nearly 600,000 people living in this region in 1770, around 10,000 men found employment in this industry. These 10,000 men represented 8% of the adult male working population. The commercial cod fishing industry had a wide impact on New England's economic life. Colonists relied on the revenue from the Atlantic cod trade, and they exchanged the dried, salted cod in order to purchase imports. These imports included trade goods and raw materials from the West Indies and Southern Europe, and from the Mid-Atlantic and Southern regions. Also, manufactured goods from Great Britain were imported. Such imports were distributed throughout New England from these fishing vessels. British victories in various European wars increased production levels in these New England fisheries at this time. The Treaty of Utrecht ended 11 years of war between France and Great Britain that had stopped the growth of this New England fishing industry. Also, the peace treaty restricted French cod fisheries in the North Atlantic, thereby opening commercial possibilities to British interests, particularly in supplying the French West Indian islands with dried cod to their plantations. Also, British wars with France and Spain between 1743 and 1763 disrupted the Atlantic cod trade, but the treaty signed at the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763 transferred most of French Canada into British hands. One witness, Brooke Watson, a merchant in London with commercial ties to fish merchants in New England, testified before Parliament in 1775 as to the 1763's treaty's positive effect on New England's cod trade to the West Indies. The most inferior fish is exported to the neutral or French islands and exchanged for molasses on very advantageous terms, as the French are prohibited from fishing. This molasses is sent to New England and manufactured into rum, which is sold for about 14 pence per gallon and used in the fisheries of New England and Newfoundland and also exported to Guinea, and these exchanged for slaves, many of whom are sold to the French and therefore eat the fish procured by the New Englanders. Although these documents gave the New England fisheries almost exclusive rights to the American coastline for fishing purposes, this was not the case, as Dr. Christopher P. McGraw, an associate professor of early American history at the University of Tennessee, explains now. The short answer is that a piece of paper that diplomats sign means very little to people living 3,000 miles across the ocean. For example, in 1763, the peace treaty that ended the Seven Years' War ceded a lot of French territory in North America to the British Empire, as you know. The problem was that this was never clearly explained to New England fishermen. The, the, the exact terms of that treaty were never precisely explained to them. And in that treaty, the French retained two islands off the coast of Newfoundland, St. Pierre and McQuellen, that still to this day are French territories. They have French post offices, fly French flags, and speak the French language. And the French retained those two islands off the coast of Newfoundland in order to give them some access to fishing waters. They weren't completely eliminated after 1763. The Brits still had competition in the fisheries after 1763. In the summer months, the fishermen would go on trips lasting anywhere from a couple days to nearly a month at a time. 
With the invention of the schooner, these fishermen were able to bring the salt and drying facilities with themselves aboard their ships. This meant that they could stay at sea for longer periods of time and could catch more cod. When the fall came, the merchantable grade cod was separated from the refuse grade cod and they were brought to markets all over the world. The merchantable grade cod was brought to the Catholic markets along the Iberian Peninsula, such as Lisbon, Bilbao, and Candice, and was exchanged for salt, wine, raisins, lemons, solid specie, and lines of credit. These goods were then brought back to American markets to be sold for a huge profit. The refuse grade cod was brought to the French West Indies to pr primarily the island of Saint-Domingue. There, the cod was given to these slave plantation owners to feed their slaves in exchange for sugar and molasses. Dr. Christopher Magra describes the value of this refuse grade cod to the plantation owners. Fish uh, was a valuable commodity, even though it was refuse, even though it, it looked bad, it had black marks on it, and it smelled bad. Uh, it was still a great source of protein. Dried cod uh, with the water weight removed is 80% pure protein. So it's a valuable resource, and that was exchanged in the Caribbean for sugar, molasses, and rum. West Indian planters from Great Britain's foremost sugar islands, Jamaica and Barbados, testified before Parliament in the year 1775 that dried salted cod was the meat of all slaves in the West Indies. Catholics and slaves to sizable Atlantic demographics regularly devoured large quantities of cod. In the French West Indies, in the island of Saint-Domingue, these fish merchants traded the refuse-grade cod to these plantation owners in exchange for both sugar and molasses, which was then brought back to New England to be manufactured into rum. This new trade with the West Indies established the rum industry of New England. Dr. McGraw talks about the importance of this trade to the establishment of the rum industry throughout New England and the American colonies. It was the lifeblood of the rum industry in New England. The, the, the rum distilleries that existed in New England would not have existed at all without the fish trade. The fish was the number one leading export in all of New England. It brought in 35% uh, of all export revenue. The, the next closest export in all of New England was Connecticut cattle that brought in 20% of annual revenue through exports. The wealth that was accumulated by these fishermen from both the refuse trade with the French West Indies and the mercantile trade with the Iberian Peninsula had huge benefits to New England economy. It is known as a spread effect throughout the economy which had both forward linkages and backward linkages. The forward linkages were parts of the economy and industries that benefited from this trade that weren't connected directly to fishing, such as textile mills. Backward linkages were industries that benefited from the trade that were essential to the process of making dried and salted cod trade possible. One of these industries was the shipbuilding industry. This production of dried and salted cod directly injected wealth into this industry so that more and more ships could be built and also maintained. It also benefited the rope walks. This industry created rope that was necessary to build these ships used to catch the cod. The rum distilleries were both backward linkages and forward linkages because the wealth that was instilled in this industry caused the rum industry to explode in production. This made it a forward linkage and the fact that the fishermen were some of the largest consumers of this rum made this ripple of wealth also a backward linkage. In conclusion, this trade between the New England fishermen and the plantation owners of the West Indies, along with also the Iberian Peninsula, had a huge impact economically on New England. It created the prominent rum industry along with injecting wealth into other industries around itself.
It was a whole lot more than just catching some fish.